Indigenous people were stewards of this land long before the founding of Canada or Ontario. And amid a growing recognition that the future for all of us on this land requires meaningful collaboration, initiatives for land conservation might also be mapping pathways of reconciliation. With us now to find out more, let's welcome in Victoria, British Columbia, Bob Joseph, President of Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc. In Treaty 6, Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, Amy Christensen, Indigenous Fire Specialist at Parks Canada and co-host of the Good Fire podcast. In the West End of the provincial capital, Faisal Mula, Associate Professor at the University of Guelph and Research Lead for Biocultural Indicators and Outcomes Research Stream for the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. And here in our studio, J.P. Gladue, Principal at Mokwate Limited, a consultancy bringing Indigenous communities and the business sector together. And we are delighted to welcome all of you, uh, in some cases back to our program, in some cases for the first time to our program. It's great to see you all. And Amy, I'll just arbitrarily, if I can, start with you and maybe just have you tell us uh, a little bit more about what it is that your group does. So, um, yeah, I, so I'm Amy. I'm from uh, Treaty 8 territory, actually my family. So I'm a Métis woman. I live right now in Treaty 6, and I work with Parks Canada as an Indigenous fire specialist. So um, before uh, colonization of Canada, Indigenous people used fire on the landscape, basically to achieve different cultural objectives, but also to reduce their wildfire risk. And so right now, um, I'm working with Parks Canada to develop relationships with nations to be able to bring that practice back. And what is the Good Fire podcast all about? Yeah, so in the Good Fire podcast, we talk with Indigenous fire specialists from around the world about how they're using fire on the land, what challenges they have with putting fire back. Um, and yeah, it's just a really great opportunity to just have some open and honest chats with some of the leading um, Indigenous fire keepers. Gotcha. Faisal, how about to you? Uh, maybe you could help us understand a little more about conservation through reconciliation and Canada's current efforts to conserve more natural spaces. How are you involved in that? Sure, thanks. Um, well, I'm a professor at the University of Guelph. I also spent about 20 years in Canada's environmental movement. I was the former director general of the Davis Suzuki Foundation. Uh, the work of my colleagues, this is an Indigenous-led uh, pan-national initiative in support of Indigenous-led conservation of traditional lands and waters and the resurgence of Indigenous conservation governance across the country. And we're actually working internationally as well. Now, here's a technical term, Indigenous protected and conserved areas. What are those? Yeah, so Indigenous protected and conserved areas, uh, you know, in many ways, I see this as a complementary form of governance to the sort of parks and protected areas that most Canadians probably have some familiarity with or perhaps are, are even visiting this summer going camping or hiking or fishing or, or such. What makes Indigenous protected and conserved areas different is that these are areas that are established by Indigenous peoples themselves under their own diversity of governance systems. And they're not just focused around the protection of the habitat for plants and animals, but also places where Indigenous peoples can continue to exercise their millennia long relationship with nature. And, you know, my colleague, Dr. Amy there, gave an example of the cultural use of fire. That's a biocultural practice that Indigenous peoples have used for thousands of years for the betterment of biodiversity in Canada and across the planet. Gotcha. Bob, I know that there are many Canadians now who are more open to the message of reconciliation than perhaps at any other time in our long history together, but uh, they may not understand how land conservation and protection plays into that. Could you help us understand that? Yeah, I think uh, when we think about uh, land conservation and protection, we have a uh, a lot of uh, contributions that we can make when it comes to uh, that conversation. Um, a lot of the work that I do um, focuses around uh, development, industrial development, crown land development, those kinds of things, and trying to trying to uh, strike that balance of uh, conservation and protection and helping people understand the different objectives that people may have when they come to those conversations, right? When we think about, um, say, a, a group like the Nature Conservancy of Canada and or Ducks Unlimited or, you know, one of those types of organizations that Indigenous peoples, they, they would share many common interests, but maybe for slightly different reasons. And so that's what I try to 
help people understand they would you know they'd want to conserve to maybe continue exercising their rights to fish or hunt or you know gather medicinal plants those kinds of things i think would be um, important for people to understand and that's what i try to do well let me explore whether or not you have common interests here with jp because jp of course has been on our program in the past as well talking about a more business-like approach and uh, the development of natural resources that we have here. And is there anything inconsistent about what you are about and what the others uh, here are about? No, I think we're all walking a very similar line that we're trying to find um, ways to balance conservation, put indigenous people in the front or co-drivers in some cases to make sure that our knowledge systems are brought to the forefront so that we can have a balanced approach. It, it shouldn't be an either or. We have to balance economy, responsible, sustainable development, uh, along with uh, conservation initiatives. I'm very familiar with Bob, a longtime friend, and I'm getting to know Amy. And, I'm really excited. I'm a forester by tra training, Amy, and I love to, to love to know more about what you're doing. And Faisal, I mean, it is absolutely important that we bring all these knowledge systems together. It's, it's a shame that it's taken this long for Canada and provinces to recognize that we've got thousands of years of traditional knowledge that is in the wings waiting to be applied to the way that we actually manage our, our lands. And using that knowledge system is, is paramount. I'm going to do a little follow-up with you here, because obviously there will be some who think that land conservation is inconsistent with resource development and therefore there's a collision course as opposed to a collaboration there. Mm. Not the case? Not the case. Um, there are certainly um, sections that are going to be appropriate for resource development um, and there are areas that are going to be really important for conservation and I'd, I'll share a personal story with um, how we can actually achieve those. Please. Yeah, well, you know, being, you know, my daughter loves, she loves to hunt and fish, and these aren't my typical hunting clothes, but, you know, if I had a little camel on here, it is green, I might be able to sneak up on a moose, but I am a very much a big user of the land, I hunt and fish, but my daughter comes to the land with me, we go to the water, the creek, we live on Lake, uh, Lake Nipigan, which is the biggest lake in Ontario, surrounded by the Ontario borders, I, I was just there yesterday fishing, drinking the water right out of the lake, and it's totally protected, then I can go down the reserve road, go to our sawmill that our community owns, and we're developing uh, lumber for our community and for the region to use, um, for instance, in mining. Then we go across the Trans-Canada uh, Highway, then we go across the Trans-Canada Pipeline, which provides natural gas, uh, as well as, you know, my, one of my grandfathers helped build that. Then we go to areas which are being explored for lithium mining. We hope to have uh, lithium mines in the next couple, two to three years, which is going to be a, a really important mineral in battery production and green transition. And then we go down the road a little bit further, and there's a hydro development, which my uncle uh, runs for on the behalf of three First Nations and our partner with Axor. Mm -hmm. So. We've got it all, and, and it's, not, it's not an accident um, that uh, we've got good economy and conservation. I can practice my land traditions with my daughter and pass those on. We, we can actually have it all. Bob, are you buying that cohabitation agreement we just uh, heard more um, about? Yeah, I think, I think um, really hit the nail on the head, you know, finding that sweet spot of uh, sustainability and, you know, protected areas and being able to uh, exercise Section 35 rights. It's definitely... Um, what people are looking for, I think, you know, one of the um, one of the messages we've always heard from indigenous communities is, look, we're, we're not get we're not against development, but it can't be development at all costs. We've got to try and find a way to uh, incorporate, you know, um, our our land values and um, you know water resources. And where I come from, I, I'm a little bit different here out on the uh, west coast in Victoria where I'm uh, talking to you from today, we're uh, fish people. So we worry a lot about fish and um, making sure that that's uh, an available resource for people. That, and, and it is impacted by uh, forestry and climate change and a whole bunch of uh, other things that can really uh, impact. But I do think it is something that we have to strive to do. Um, you know, uh, when we think about total conservation, one of the one of the challenges is it, it'll make it hard for the nations to move away from the Indian Act if they're not self-sufficient. So I think what uh, JP was talking about just makes so much sense. Faisal, anything inconsistent about what JP has just described and what you're about? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't disagree at all. I think the key thing here is it has to be Indigenous-led, and you know there are examples of where Indigenous protected and conserved areas are being established by Indigenous nations in response to the threat of industrial development. For example, 
Grassy Narrows First Nation, which I know that your program has looked at, they have decla declared essentially their entire traditional territory as an indigenous protected and sovereignty area, largely in response to the threat of mining and logging within the traditional territory that has the potential to exacerbate a very tragic situation, which is mercury poisoning of the watershed. In that case, what the, the nation has said really clearly is they're not opposed to industrial development within the territory, but they want to bring some certainty around how that development is going to proceed. And they see Indigenous protected and conserved areas as one manner of exerting their governance and their sovereignty in response to the sorts of activities that they do not want to happen. The same thing's happening in other First Nations as well. The Tolopiate First Nation, for example, established an Indigenous protected and conserved area uh, in on the west coast of uh, uh, British Columbia, uh, close to Tofino, in response to the threat of clear-cut logging. Uh, the Chilcotin people have done the same. They established uh, Dasico uh, Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas. So I think the key thing here is it has to be Indigenous-led. And when we say Indigenous-led, it's not just about respecting and upholding the rights of Indigenous peoples to be decision makers over their own traditional territories. It's also about integrating the knowledge systems that JP talked about, the very sophisticated understanding that Indigenous peoples have over their territories, which in many cases actually goes well beyond the understanding that I, as a Western trained scientist, have of how nature is actually operating uh, within vast areas of, of the country. Amy, could I get you to follow up on that in this regard? Do you think there's anything controversial about the Indigenous-led nature of this exercise here? In other words, it, it, is the rest of Canada, do they understand that's what's required here? Yeah, you know, I think that many Canadians still have that kind of older idea of conservation, where it's, you know, keeping wilderness and removing people from areas. So. Um, you know, when the establishment of parks and other things where people were kind of cleared out to protect wilderness. But I think what we're talking about here with Indigenous-led conservation is the recognizing that Indigenous peoples and peoples in general are an important part of the landscape. Those are our relations, our relatives, and that we can't really be excluded from them. So it's trying to see how we can sustainably all live together. And I think the point that JP made about you know, development. I think that Indigenous people are highly adaptable and have never aren't against development, but it just needs to be done in the right way, in the right places. Um, so, for example, not a ceremonial site or archaeologic site or something like that. Well, okay, let me just uh, make sure I understand you here, because there, there are some Indigenous people, and we've seen them on the news, who are opposed to a great deal of the resource development and or economic development that I think some people here on this program tonight would champion and be in favor of. So what do you do about that? Yeah, you know, I can't, I, I don't, you know, know a ton about some of those situations, but what I've heard and read and listened to folks talk about it is that mostly they're frustrated, frustrated with the lack of um, consultation or the lack of engagement about some of the development that's gone in. So where they feel like their voices aren't being heard at all. And I think that that really creates a lot of frustration um, instead of, you know, maintaining good relationships uh, between industry and Indigenous people and government. Lots of times I think that we feel like our voices aren't being included in the discussion. No, I take your point there. JP, maybe you could build on that in as much as, you know, I mean, we heard Doug Ford say this a few years ago, that if that if he didn't get everybody on side to build up the ring of fire, he's going to get up there on the bulldozer himself and start to, you know, <laughs> make stuff happen, which may not have been the best thing to say. But, but I think his point was one Indigenous group that would be opposed to the positive exploitation of the resources there should not allow the whole thing not to happen. I presume you're on side with that. Uh, I, I largely am. Uh, I used to actually sit on the board of Noron, the Ring of Fire, right. and um, so very familiar with the project and the communities. Uh, but the, Canada needs to understand we're not a monolith. Um, just like any community, 20% of our community members are going to oppose. 20% are going to be rah rah rah, and this, you know, the 60% sell good. My math is there. It all ended up 100 <laughs> uh, are going to be on the fence and need to be educated in before they make an informed decision. And that's really the big part of this conversation is having inf information. Um, and I guess one of the things that starts to um, make me feel a little unnerved is when we see these massive protests 
and you'll see a small portion, you'll see some indigenous people in there, but then you'll see non-indigenous people speaking for us, which really grates on my nerves because we have the, the, the power and the knowledge to speak for ourselves. And when they start holding signs, non-indigenous people, free prior informed consent, they, and yes, that is an important part of our conversation and you have to have the informed um, body to make informed decisions. Um, but I would also ask them, well, what, what gave you the right to speak for us to say no to our opportunities? And have you ever been to one of our Indigenous communities that have been living in poverty for a long time? And sometimes resource development is the only opportunity for our communities out of the distinct poverty that often defines our communities. Uh, okay, so let me, how do I want to put this? There are some well-meaning environmental yes, sir. people, <laughs> admittedly, probably in downtown Toronto, who've never been to places where you live, and they want to be helpful, they want to be allies, but they've just heard you say, we don't need you speaking for us. So we, what should they do? We want allies. We want them at the table to have conversations. I'd love to spend more time with Faisal to understand. I do work with uh, or environmental organizations. In fact, I chair the Boreal Leadership Champions, which is led by you know, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. You know, my good friend Valerie Courtois, who leads the Land, the, the Guardians program. We've got a, a table set up for you know, unlikely bedfellows, oil, gas, mining, forestry, finance, mm -hmm. tourism, all Indigenous leadership. It's everything that we're talking about here on the camera. But let's have these conversations together so that you don't go running off trying to speak for us without understanding us. And we also want to make sure that we understand the best Western science at the same time that Faisal leads. But let's combine our resources. Let's combine our knowledge systems and make decisions together. Our communities are absolutely tired of all these decisions happening without us at the table. We're an inviting people. Come up to our communities and understand. You mentioned a group there, and I'm going to ask Amy to explain the Guardians. Uh, what, who are the Indigenous Guardians and what do they do? Yeah, so um, I serve on an advisory group for the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, and that's where they want to um, basically establish fire guardians. So where um, people are employed basically by their nation to work on fire management in their territory. So that includes um, not only looking at, you know, fire suppression, so putting out fires, but also in reducing wildfire risk, in monitoring cultural keystone species, in working with their community and educating youth about Indigenous knowledge. So as Faisal mentioned before, it's really about putting Indigenous people in charge of monitoring in their territories. All right, Bob, maybe you could follow up on that by answering, if there are more Indigenous-led initiatives, how does that affect their communities? Well, I think that they that will return them and really reconnect them back with their communities. Remember, the Indian Act really uh, confined them, made them stick to uh, to the reserves. Um, but I, I do know when I think about uh, think about uh, Treaty Eight territory, for example, you know, there's been a recent decision, the Blueberry decision, which started to um, really address an issue that was important around development, which was cumulative impacts, and I think. Uh, cumulative impacts, it, you know, really was an expression from the, uh, the blueberry to say, hey, we don't just want to talk about one drill site. We want to talk about a whole bunch of drill sites and roads and and everything that's impacting our community. So I think, you know, there were some great insights from that. Just when we think about the people and communities, and I think there's going to be some uh, very strong legal support coming out of, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada and governments will have to really start to pay attention to um, the cumulative impacts, which, you know, largely when I think about uh, Ontario, they're maybe thinking about their treaty rates and how they're impacted by all of the development. And just uh, give, uh, us, give us a titch of the background there. That Treaty 8 is where and the Blueberry decision is what? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, Treaty 8, pardon me, <laughs> British Columbia, I forget, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased, that's where I'm, I'm coming from here today. So northeastern British Columbia, it, uh, Treaty 8 covers about 27% of the province, and um, and the uh, Blueberry First Nation is a, a nation that brought forward this court case really around consultation, as Amy and JP mentioned, which is an important piece of the conversation. They really um, were unhappy with being consulted about, you know, sort of one project versus all of the, you know, for example, drill sites in their territory. And what they were saying is, we don't just want to talk to you about 
the one drill site. That's just that's not a big enough world view that they're trying to bring to the conversation. And um, and so they went to uh, the Supreme Court of Canada and the Supreme Court of Canada said, yes, we need to really start to take into account the cumulative impacts, which I think puts even more emphasis on, you know, protection and uh, environmental issues will become even more important in the conversations that especially the ones that are led by uh, consultation. Understood. Faisal, what would you say are the biggest obstacles to you being able to do what you do more of and better? Yeah, so a lot of this has to do with the policy framework in which Indigenous peoples are bringing forward these incredibly ambitious um, plans for conserving vast, vast regions of the country. I, I, I think it's really important for Canadians to understand that, you know, notwithstanding being a vast country of mountains and ice and, and old growth forests, that what's sometimes refer people refer to as wilderness is is a really um, incorrect understanding of of the country. Um, you know, places like the far north of Canada, the boreal, the Arctic, uh, the temperate rainforests of the BC coast, these are not unpeopled places. These continue to be the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples and have been under their stewardship for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, Western science is only now beginning to understand that many of the conservation values that we're trying to protect, like the habitat of caribou and, and old growth forests and such, are directly an outcome of Indigenous-led stewardship, the, the traditional use of fire, for example, that Amy has mentioned. The problem is, is that Canada's policy and laws around the establishment of Indigenous protected and conserved areas have not really caught up with this resurgence in Indigenous conservation leadership. There really is no legislation in Canada that Indigenous peoples can avail themselves to establish an IPCA within their traditional territories. Now, things are moving really, really fast. And in fact, this morning, something really big happened, which was an announcement that the final negotiations of the, a global biodiversity treaty are going to be moved from Kunming, China to Montreal, Canada at the end of December. So this is when all of the countries of the world that are signatories to an international convention on biodiversity are going to sign an international treaty that is essentially going to set the global agenda for the conservation of nature for the next you know several decades this is an excellent opportunity uh, for the country to really emphasize and amplify the leadership of indigenous peoples when it comes to the conservation of traditional territories what do you need from the federal government then to to give greater effect to what you've just talked about well, the federal government has actually done something very good. I'm usually a very cr big critic of government policy as a, as a professor of environmental policy. But one of the things that Canada has done is, the first thing is the Prime Minister made an announcement several, uh, actually a year ago, that Canada is going to try to protect 30% of the country by 2030. This is probably going to be the target that is going to be signed at the uh, COP15, which is this big international gathering of nations that's going to happen in Montreal from December 5th to December 17th of 2022. Uh, the one thing the federal government has said really clearly is that Canada's ability to reach these really ambitious targets around conservation will not happen without Indigenous peoples. In other words, I suspect that all of the new parks and protected areas that we see being established from now on are going to be Indigenous-led. They're going to be Indigenous-protected and conserved areas, and they're going to happen all across the country, not just in the far north, but even in urban areas. I mean, the Canadian government is on track to establishing 10 new urban federal parks. All of those parks are going to be established with the Indigenous peoples who have called these areas uh, their traditional territories for thousands of years be before our cities and suburbs arose across the country, including where I am here in Toronto, which is... The, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and uh, Anishinaabe and Mississauga's peoples. JP, I wonder whether you think we have reached uh, a point in time in the history of Canada and its relationship with Indigenous peoples to the point where there is mutual respect, there is an understanding about how to go forward and make progress, and we're unlikely to backpedal on that. We are, we are now in a new way of doing things. Do you think we're there? We have hit a tipping point, 100%. Um, I don't think, it doesn't matter what government gets in next time, uh, there's not going to be any backpedaling because the precedents are now being set. We've got 
I mean, you talked to, to Bob about this and, you know, all the legal precedents, um, everything that's been set in front of us now is, is a path. And, you know, now with the United Nations Declara Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, Canada adopting that, BC's already ahead of the, ahead of the curve on that. Those, those pieces of legislation, the way that we're going to relate together, it's, it's a new path. There are certainly things that we need to do to strengthen the path together. Um, like capitalization, um, more support for Indigenous capacity to participate at tables, making sure that our people are on par with the rest of other Canadians. I mean, we've got quite a diverse spectrum of capacity from the very poor to some of the most successful people in the country. Um, and there's still a, a major gap there that needs to be filled. But I think, you know, I'm excited about the future. I've got an 18 year old daughter who, like I said, loves to come up and hunt and fish, but she's moving to Montreal soon for school. and. Uh, I'm excited for her future. Is she going to cut your hair going forward? I, I, she, I hope so. I, she, she did it during the pandemic, and uh, she did not a bad job, but I'm looking forward to a little more training. <laughs> she going to school for that? She is. Good for you. Okay. Uh, Amy, can I get you to follow up on that? Do you think we're... Actually, you know what? This Martin Luther King quote just popped into my head, so let me put that to you, which is that essentially, you know, history's arc bends towards justice. Um, but not always uninterrupted, I think is the line we should put in brackets after that. Are you convinced that, that we're headed in the right direction without interruption? Yeah, so I think that there probably will be interruptions, unfortunately, but I think like the other panelists had said, with some of the legal precedents that are being set, like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, as well, the TRC calls for, you know, continuance of culture and we can't have culture without having uh, healthy lands to base our culture on. So I do see a lot of steps forward and momentum um, in this way. And I think the um, general Canadian public as well is becoming much more educated about some of these issues like residential schools, about um, conservation and other things. So I think that that helps um, move momentum in our favor. And there's lots of Western studies coming out too that are showing you know, the importance of Indigenous people in promoting biodiversity, that we have 80% of the world's biodiversity under our management. So I think that, you know, the more and more things that come out like that, it's just going to strengthen public resolve in our favour. Gotcha. I should do one last fact check in our last 30 seconds here. JP, did I hear you say earlier that Lake Nipigon is the biggest great lake in the province? It's the biggest not, lake. Not Great Lake, sorry. Biggest lake. Well, it's sometimes referred to the Sixth Great Lake. Yeah. Uh, it is the biggest lake in Ontario when you think about being surrounded by the Ontario borders. Bigger than Superior? No, the, surrounded by the Ontario borders. Surrounded by the so Ontario borders. Yeah, it's massive. Okay. And like I said, like I just yesterday, I was fishing it and drinking the water right out of the lake, and the fishing's incredible. Gotcha. You can come okay. up fishing anytime. Uh, you know, invite me. I'd come. I'd love to. <laughs> Never been there. Love to do it. Um, Mr. Director, that's what I needed, a sh four shot of everybody. Can I thank JP and Faisal and Bob and Amy for coming onto our program tonight. We hope this has been a meaningful day for all of you, and we look forward to uh, welcoming you on our program once again at future times. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.